So one remark I'll make about this proof we did last time. So here was the, the theorem we just finished proving. That is that if you have a function on a group, uh, so then it's a positive type if and only if the sure multiplier uh, maps the C star reduced group C star algebra into itself and is UCP. And this is if and only if it also maps the von Neumann algebra into itself and is UCP. And here you get a normal map as well for free. Um, and uh, so one remark I'll make about it is about the proof uh, so that three implies one. So this is, we gave this at the end last time. So here's the proof uh, that, uh, well, there's the proof one implies two. And then here's the proof uh, three implies one, starting right here. So there's the proof of three implies one. And uh, the remark I'll make is that in this proof, or also two implies one, same proof. Uh, so the remark I'll, I'll make is that in this proof, we didn't actually assume anywhere that this was the sure multiplier. All we supposed was that and this was a UCP map. And then we constructed, we showed that therefore we get this map, we get this representation. And so we get this map is uh, of positive type. And then it just happened that when we had a sure multiplier, we got this our original map back for this map. But whenever you have a UCP map on uh, say L gamma mapping it into itself, or whenever you have a UCP map from a C star out from this reduced group C star algebra to itself, you do get a positive type function on the group. It's just may not, uh, you know, that's, that's the remark I'll make. And if you start with the sure multiplier, then you get the original pos positive type function back. But in general, this gives you a new way to construct positive type functions. In fact, they just come from this representation we discussed, discussed here. All right, but that's that's just a remark. So there's, we know that going from groups to C star algebras or von Neumann algebras, we have this way, this sure multiplier, um, taking positive type functions to completely positive maps. But we also have a way of going from completely positive maps on the von o the group von Neumann algebra to positive type functions on the group, and this. Uh, this map going the other way is uh, takes the original sure multiplier back to itself if you start with that. All right, so that's a remark which will maybe come up uh, a little bit later. All right, so what I wanted to do in today's lecture was just uh, kind of a review of some of the operator algebras. So I want to I want to talk a little bit more about von Neumann algebras before we move on to our ne next topic, which is inter amenable groups. And interamenable groups really come from a phenomenon that happens in von Neumann algebras. So this, this notion was introduced by Efros studying group von Neumann algebras. And so we've already had uh, some preliminaries on group von Neumann algebras, uh, but I wanted to just make sure, since I know not everybody in this class have, has had operator algebras or a, 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 an extensive course in operator algebras. So I wanna do some basic properties of operator algebras uh, so basic constructions. Um, okay, so here are some preliminary results and von Neumann algebras. All right, so some of these I'll actually prove, and and most of them though I'll just state as classic facts that you can look up. So the foundations of von Neumann algebras were laid out in a series of papers by Murray and von Neumann in the late 30s to early 50s. Um, and still to this day that that's the source for most of what I'm going to say in this lecture. That that's They really lay down quite a comprehensive uh, list of foundations for the theory. Uh, in fact, in some sense, maybe they did too much because it took a while to move beyond the initial theory because they, they almost answered all the questions they, they originally asked. All right, so uh, what is a von Neumann algebra? So we've already mentioned it before, but uh, if M is a subalgebra of B of H, um, 
is a stars of algebra. So star meaning it contains adjoints. So adjoint, it's closed undertaken adjoints is stars of algebra uh, such that it also contains the identity. So then M is a von Neumann algebra. Uh, algebra. Uh, if it is closed in the strong operator topology, if it is closed in the strong operator topology, which the strong operator topology, I think we've already mentioned a number of times, but this is just the topology that a net converges to some operator if and only if, uh, whenever you apply a vector t x c, this converges to t x c in the Hilbert space in H. And this is for all c in H. So that's the strong operator topology. Uh, now this is the definition of a von Neumann algebra, but it turns out that uh, so the strong operator topology, there's also the weak operator topology, which is just that you allow these to converge weakly. And the, they have the same linear functionals, continuous linear functionals, strong and weak operator topologies. So therefore, we know that the, from the Hahn-Bonnach theorem that they have the same convex sets. So in particular, since an algebra is a convex set, if it's closed in the SOT, that's also closed in the WOT. So this is if and only if it's closed in the strong operator topology. And this is if and only if it is closed in the weak operator topology, which as I mentioned, this is just TI, net TI converges to T, if and only if TI C converges to T C uh, weakly for all C and H. Um, and like I said, strong operator topology, weak operator topologies have the same closed convex sets. And this is just the Hahn Bonnach theorem because they have the same dual, um, the same continuous linear functionals. And, uh, and so therefore, it's closed in one of them, all closed in all uh, And this is also if and only if M is equal to its bicommutant. And this uh, is a non trivial result, uh, which is the theorem of von Neumann. from 1929, I believe. All right, so that's, uh, um, that's his bicommutant theorem. Um, so here, I think uh, we've already used this notation before, but uh, let me just remind you the definition of a commutant. So if you have a set S, then the commutant, it's the set of all operators T and B of H, such that TS is equal to ST, and this is for all S and S. So uh, this just says you compute with everything that commutes with everything that can uh, within M. Um, all right, so that's von Neumann's bicommutant theorem. And there are some standard examples, which were again introduced by Murray and von Neumann. Uh, so one is that if X mu is a standard measure space, standard. Uh, probability space C, or any measure space, let me say, standard measure space. Uh, so standard measure space is something that's a well-defined notion. Not every measure space is a standard measure space. However, re really all I need is that you, you should remove sort of pathological examples that nobody cares about. Uh, so what you need for this example, uh, it's just that you need that it satisfies the Radon Nicodeme theorem. Right? That's all I need. Uh, so if you have such a space, then L infinity of X mu, we can embed this inside of bounded operators on L2 of X mu. And this is by pointwise multiplication. So by pointwise multiplication. So we think of functions, bounded functions, as operators on L2 by just pointwise multiplication. So these are multiplication operators. Uh, so then this is a von Neumann algebra. In fact, here you can check, uh, in fact, so how do you see it's a von Neumann algebra? Well, you compute its commutant. 
well, we need to compute it by commutant, but here you can check that already ln infinity of x mu is equal to its commutant itself. So in particular, it's also equal to its by commutant. Um, and this is a good exercise. If you haven't done this before, I recommend doing this. You start with an arbitrary operator that commutes with L infinity of x mu, and you want to prove that it is multiplication by a bounded function. That's where you use Rado Nicodem, right? Uh, no, even just to, uh, I believe even just to define, to, to show that this is weakly closed. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, to, to prove you get a von Neumann algebra. Yes, you will need Rado Nicodem. Um, yeah, and this is a bit easier also if you assume you would say probability measure or sigma finite, then, it, then it's not much more difficult. Uh, in the general setting, it's, it's kind of a technical mess. Um, okay. Uh, so this is a perfectly nice example of a von Neumann algebra. Another example we've already seen a number of times uh, is that if gamma is a group, so then you have L gamma, which is the von Neumann algebra generated by the left regular representation. And this is a von Neumann subalgebra of V of L2 of the group gamma. So this is another nice example of, of von Neumann algebras. Uh, another example of von Neumann algebras. So these were also in, introduced by Murray and von Neumann, these group von Neumann algebras. Uh, another example of, of a von Neumann algebra introduced by Murray and von Neumann is if you combine these two notions, and let's suppose we have gamma group and x mu, uh, say a standard, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and say it's a probability space at this point. Probability space. My kids are a little rambunctious right now. Uh, so we have a standard probability space, and let's suppose that we have gamma a quasi-invariant action. So this is quasi-invariant. So quasi-invariant just means that it preserves null sets. So preserves null sets. So if a set has measure zero and you apply a group element, you again stay measure zero. But we aren't requiring measure preserving in general. Uh, so what can you do here? Well, uh, associated to this, uh, action, you have the so-called Koopman representation. Koopman representation, which I'll denote by sigma superscript zero. So this is a map from gamma to the unitary operators on L2 of x mu. And this is given by uh, sigma zero of t. I want to apply this to some function c. And what this is, is this is just going to be C compose uh, T inverse, where T is acting on the set X. So composing T inverse makes sense here. And if it were measure preserving, this is all I would like to do. But if it's not measure preserving, then you also have to modify this formula by the rod on nicotine derivative to make sure you get a unitary. Uh, and so for that, the corresponding factor here is uh, going to be something like this. So you want to do this. Uh, you want to maybe compose again an inverse, and then you want to take a square root. Uh, square root. All right. So here's your rada nicotine derivative, uh, which exists because gamma preserves null sets. So mu and gamma mu are going to be in the same measure class. So we have rada nicotine derivative, uh, and then we compose by gamma inverse, take square root. Or, sorry. Well, what gamma, is this gamma? Gamma is t. I changed notation in the middle of writing that. Gamma is t. All right. OK, and then uh, the observation is that this is indeed a unitary representation. And that's, again, uh, you just compute out the norm squared of this, and you see what it is. Uh, this is easy. Uh, so then what can you do? And the other observation is, uh, well, so what do you do? So you consider now the. This is the crossed product denoted by L infinity mu. And then we have this symmetric product symbol and then gamma. Um, and what is this? This is defined to be the uh, von Neumann algebra generated by, you have this copy of L infinity. Uh, so this is going to be a subalgebra 
of bounded operators on L2 of X mu tensor L2 of gamma. And this is going to be the von Neumann algebra generated by, you're going to have a copy of L infinity of X mu acting on L2, and then you say tensor the scalar, so it acts trivially on L2. And then you also have a copy of the group, which are going to be given by unitary sigma naught T tensor lambda T. And this is for T and gamma. And then you look at the von Neumann algebra generated by that. And that's called the group measure space construction. So it's the group measure space construction. Uh, and it's called, it's the, I'll write this out, it's the crossed product of L infinity of x mu with gamma. I don't know why I'm putting that in quotes. There's no reason to put it in quotes. All right, so that's the group measure space construction or the cross product of L infinity of x mu with, with gamma. Uh, so this is, uh, was another nice class of von Neumann algebra introduced by Marine von Neumann. Uh, actually, maybe a remark, and that is that um, when your measure space is the trivial measure space, then you see here that in this case, the Koopman representation is the trivial representation. So uh, you get just another definition of the group von Neumann algebra. And this is, uh, this is kind of a funny remark because Murray and von Neumann uh, introduced this uh, group measure space construction in their second paper, but the group von Neumann algebra they introduced in their fourth paper. And they remark even in their fourth paper that it's, we're not sure why we missed the fact that you could take the trivial action on the trivial space and that works perfectly well. Um, that's just a remark. Um, one other remark I want to make is that even it, even in the when you have a non-trivial action, uh, you always get a copy of the group von Neumann algebra in this measure space, and that's because this representation here uh, is always conjugate to the left regular representation to a multiple left regular representation. And this is a, a well-known lemma, which we'll write down because we're going to use it uh, probably in the future. And this is uh, Fell's absorption lemma. Which just says that if we have gamma group and we have, uh, say, sigma naught mapping gamma to the unitary group of any Hilbert space, a representation. So then the representation sigma naught tensor lambda is conjugate to the trivial representation ten tensor lambda. Uh, so there's some unitary which conjugates these two representations. So in particular, uh, Fell's absorption lemma Well, from here we see where we get a trivial representation tensor the left regular representation. And so we know that that generates the group von Neumann algebra. So we get that therefore these unitaries here actually, and usually these are denoted UT, uh, we actually get that this uh, gives an embedding of L gamma into the cross product. So we already have an embedding of L infinity um, but we also have an embedding of, of L gamma. And then the other remark I'll make is that uh, what are these unitaries? What's the property of these unitaries? Why, why do we use the notion of semi-direct product? And that's because uh, we also have the fact that um, if you look at uh, if F is in L infinity of X mu and we have um, which we view inside of this cross product, and we have T and gamma, then if you look at UT star F UT, this is exactly F composed T inverse. 
So this action on gamma is encoded within this von Neumann algebra, in other words. Or so the action of gamma on the measure space, or on the L infinity space, rather, is encoded in this von Neumann algebra. Right. Okay, so the von Neumann algebra contains the measure space. It also contains the group algebra. And conjugating by these unitaries gives you the action on L infinity. So this is a very nice situation. Uh, but that depends on this Fell's absorption lemma. So let me give a proof of this to you now. Uh, so here we just, uh, it's very constructive, very simple proof. We just define this map F from H tensor L2 of gamma to itself. And we do this by F at, I'll tell you what it does on these elementary tensors. And this is just going to be sigma T inverse tensor XC tensor delta T. So this is what it does on, on these elementary tensors. But actually, you see, since we have t here and t here, uh, we see that when we take uh, sums, these are going to map to orthogonal subspaces. Uh, so that this will indeed extend linearly to a unitary. So this extends linearly to a unitary. And then I claim that this is the unitary which conjugates these two representations. And for that, um, all we need to do is just do a computation. So we'll compute one tensor lambda s, f, and then times c tensor delta t. And then we see what we get here. So this is one tensor lambda s. And now we have sigma t inverse naught c tensor delta t. And so now this is sigma t inverse naught c tensor delta st. Uh, but now we want to apply the inverse of this unitary. And this unitary took the co if something had a coefficient of t, it mapped it to sigma t inverse times that vector. So the inverse of that is going to map something to uh, this coefficient here is st. So it's going to map it to st times this. So this is going to be exactly um, f times, and now we have here sigma st, but then the t is canceled, so it's sigma s naught c tensor delta st, which is now equal to f, and now we have here sigma naught s tensor lambda s times c tensor delta t. Right, so what have we shown? We've shown that therefore uh, this operator is the same as this operator right here, which exactly says that this representation is conjugate to this representation. All right, so that's Fell's absorption limit. That's a fun, that's a fun limit. All right, so we have uh, a B, we have L infinity spaces, we have group von Neumann algebras, we have group measure space constructions. So these are be, these will be the basic examples of von Neumann algebras I'll use in this class. So I won't introduce other ones, but there are many others now at this point. Uh, so back to general theory of von Neumann algebras. Uh, so one thing we have is that uh, if we look at B of H, well, this is naturally a dual space. So bounded operators on a Hilbert space is dual to the space of trace class operators on the Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a natural duality here, which is given by, if you have a bounded operator and a trace class operator, then their pairing is just given by just the trace of uh, T with A. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you are not familiar with trace class operators, uh, you can look these up in, in an operator algebra book, something like this. Uh, but this is the non-commutative version of the fact that L infinity of the natural numbers or any set is isomorphic to the dual of L1 of that set. So this is like the non-commutative version of this statement, which, which you should all be familiar with. 
uh, is exactly this. And the trace class operators are like non-commutative L1, little L1. Um, all right, so in particular, B of H is a dual space, and so it has a weak star topology. And uh, so the weak star topology on B of H, this is sometimes called the sigma weak operator topology. Uh, but for us, uh, the only remark I'll make, so I'm not going to define this, uh, well, I mean, it is just the weak star topology, but the remark I'll make is that on bounded sets, this is the same as the weak operator topology. So this is the same as the weak operator topology on bounded sets. Uh, so, yeah, so in particular, what this means is that like Banakalagalu, which says that the uniball of a dual space is compact in the weak star topology, uh, we can apply that to B of H, so that the, say, the uniball of B of H is compact in the weak operator topology, because that agrees with the sigma weak topology, which is the weak star topology. Uh, so that's some remark about that. The other remark I'll make is that uh, since they agree on bounded sets, again, this means that they'll have um, they'll have the same. Well, from this fact, you can conclude for without too much work that being for a convex set or for a von Neumann algebra to be closed in the weak operator topology is the same as to be closed in the C sigma weak operator topology. So we have that M sitting inside of B of H, a von Neumann algebra. So then M is weak star closed. And M being weak star closed means that it also is the dual of some uh, subspace, some annihilator subspace or, or something like this in L1. So I get that therefore, M is the dual of some subspace here. Specifically, if you look at the, all the corresponding linear functionals from the trace class operators, they'll give you some subspace on M, or they'll give you some subspace of linear functionals on M, and you get that M is the dual of that space. Right? So von Neumann algebras are always dual Banach spaces. Uh, and so in particular, things like Banakalagalu, we can apply to the uniball of any von Neumann algebra, not just B of H. The other remark is that, um, is that a result of Sakai, he shows, in fact, that this pre-dual is, so I've defined it as a certain subspace of linear functionals corresponding to trace class operators, but Sakai proved that it's actually unique. There's only one Banach space up to isomorphism that's isomorphic to the pre-dual of any von Neumann out, any fixed von Neumann out. Uh, so by Sakai, we have that the pre-dual is unique. And moreover, a C star algebra, a unital C star algebra. A is isomorphic to a von Neumann algebra if and only if uh, A is the dual of a Banach space, is the dual of a Banach space. And then that Banach space has to be the unique pre-dual of A. Uh, so this this means that this means two things uh, as a corollary of Sakai's theorem. The the nicest corollary you get is that in particular, if you have just an algebraic isomorphism of von Neumann algebras, so if M and N are von Neumann algebras and theta mapping M 
in is a star isomorphism. Well, star, star isomorphisms between C star algebras are automatically uh, norm preserving, um, just because you can recover the norm from the spectrum of any normal operator. So, so that shows that. Uh, so isomorphisms between C star algebras are norm preserving. But then again, here we have that you have a unique pre-dual. And so this means that it has to take the, the dual of this theta has to take the pre-dual of one to the pre-dual of the other. So in other words, that this isomorphism preserves the uh, pre-dual, the weak star topology. So if this is an isomorphism, so then theta preserves the weak star topology. just because there's a unique weak, weak star topology. Uh, so this is nice. This, this means that, I mean, you think of von Neumann algebras, really they're subalgebras of B of H. Uh, they have their you know, corresponding topologies in B of H, but actually by Sakai's theorem, you can think of them just purely in terms of algebra. So these are just algebras that we were interested in the isomorphism class of these algebras. And the topology, both the norm topology and the weak star topology are actually already in, remembered just by the algebra. The, algebra. the algebraic structure already determines uh, the norm and, and weak star topologies. So this, this, is, a, this is a nice thing. Uh, okay, so that's Sakai's theorem, which again, I won't prove, but you can look that up. It's a little bit technical, but it's not bad. Um, yeah, so what else do I want to say? This is also one reason why, even though von Neumann algebras are defined as subalgebras of bounded operators on a Hilbert space, usually if you look up in the literature, people are only interested in them up to isomorphism. Uh, so really you only, you don't care about the Hilbert space itself. You really care about the, the, the von Neumann algebra as an algebra. Uh, and then there's another reason for that, and that's because of rep, uh, Murray and von Neumann completely classified representation theory, at least in, in many cases. Uh, so now let me talk about states. So uh, a state tau from M to the complex numbers is normal if uh, it is continuous with respect to the, say, weak star topology. The weak star topology is a little bit nice because as I mentioned, it doesn't depend on which Hilbert space you're, you're acting on. Uh, but uh, the remark I'll make is that for linear functionals, the being continuous in the weak star topology is same as being continuous in weak operator topology, same as being continuous in strong operator topologies. So any, any of these topologies for linear functionals, continuity is the same. All right, so that's a normal linear functional. We'll also say that tau is, uh, tau is faithful. If, maybe we've seen this already before, if you look at, uh, if you apply it to a positive operator and you get zero, then this is if and only if well, it implies that x is zero. It implies that x. So if you have a non-zero element, then the trace of x star x should be non-zero. That's a faithful, faithful state. Oh, I said trace, I meant state. And then we'll say tracial, tau is tracial. If tau of xy is equal to tau of yx, and this is for all and y and m. So these are the von Neumann algebras which will appear in this class most often, and these are the ones I particularly care about. Uh, so let's do some examples of them. Uh, one is that if you have the n by n matrices, so this is just bounded operators on Cn, that's perfectly nice von Neumann algebra. And then here you can consider the trace to be one over n times the usual trace that you know from linear algebra. Uh, so that's certainly a faithful 
uh, tracial state. So that's a trace. Uh, a more interesting example, or how about uh, we could take L infinity of X mu, X standard space, and we could take the trace to be the integral uh, with respect to mu. So that's a perfectly nice state, a linear functional. And of course, the tracial property is, is a vacuous condition here because it's abelian. So uh, another example, we've already mentioned this before, is L gamma. And the trace on L gamma is given by, uh, we apply the Dirac function here and apply the Dirac function here. And of course, this is a vector state. So to see that it's normal is obvious because uh, the weak operator topology is given by vectors. And so here we have a vector state. Uh, so this is clearly a normal. And, uh, and it's a good exercise to show that this is tracial and, and faithful. This is a good exercise. And then another uh, example is that if gamma is acting on x mu, and if this is probability, uh, and if this is measure preserving, so before we just wanted to define the cross product, you just need that it's quasi invariant. But if it's measure preserving, then you get a trace. Uh, so then you can define tau of an operator x to be here at all again be a vector state but we're here we're going to take the vector uh the constant function one so this is an l2 because we have a probability measure um so and then we tensor with the Dirac function at the identity and we yeah. so this is our vector state here and then again, in this case, uh, it's a really good exercise to prove that uh, this is indeed a, uh, well, it's clearly a state, it's clearly normal, but it's also faithful and it is tracial. So these are, these are nice properties. And here you're gonna have to use measure preserving to prove tracial. So measure preserving. Implies is tracial. So this gives us a normal, normal faithful trace. Uh, all right, so what good is a trace? Well, the nice thing about a trace is you can do, well, any state, you can do the GNS construction. And if you have a normal state, you get a normal representation. And if you have a tracial state, you get a, a particularly nice normal representation. So if uh, if tau is a trace, so then the GNS construction uh, representation gives the so-called the standard representation. And again, when I say trace, I mean normal, faithful, trace, uh, standard representation. So, uh, which we think of as M, so M sits inside of bounded operators on L2 of M with respect to tau. So this is the GNS uh, construction. Now, if you maybe, so we did the GNS construction, but let me just remind you how it's defined. So this L2 of M tau, it was defined to be the completion of M with respect to this inner product here, where the inner product of x and y with respect to tau is exactly tau of y star x. So that was how the GNS construction was defined. And then the representation is just given by left multiplication. So this is the GNS representation, or it's called the standard representation. Uh, when you have a normal faithful trace. Um, excuse me, professor. Yes. How do you define the integral of L infinity function? Uh, the integral, well, L, because I'm taking probability measure, uh, so this is, yeah, so this should be mu probability measure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So that uh, bounded functions are in particular L1 integrable.
Otherwise, it doesn't give you a state. It gives you something called a weight, but we're not going to deal with weights in this class. OK, so this is the standard representation. One, the nice thing about the standard representation is we have this conjugation operator. So this maps L2 of m to L2 of m. And it's given by j. I'll define it on a dense subset. That is that if you have x, and I'm going to denote, so we have here uh, m is a von Neumann algebra, but it's also when we take the GNS construction, it's defined to be the closure of m. So when I think of it as sitting inside the Hilbert space, I'm going to draw a hat on it. And this is similar to how you think of, uh, again, in a probability space, you can think of L infinity functions as L2 functions. L infinity is inside of L2. Uh, so here, when I'm thinking of it as inside of L2, I'm going to put a hat here. And so I'm going to define j of x hat. This is going to be exactly x star hat. This is for x and m. That's the conjugation operator. And the nice thing about tau being a trace is that the conjugation operator is an isometry. So it's not linear. I should point that out. This is anti-linear. So j of i times x is negative i times j of x. Um, but is still an isometry. In fact, we can check what is j x hat. So in particular, it extends to all of L2 since it's an isometry. Uh, so the subscript, you can put tau, or oftentimes you'll also put two, so subscript two here. So I generally put subscript two. Uh, so if we compute this, what is this? Well, this is defined to be x star hat two squared which is defined to be the trace of, well, we have x star star, so that's x and then x star. But now we have a trace, so this is the same as the trace of x star x, which is the norm of x hat 2 squared. So we see that j is an isometry and hence extends to an isometry on all of L2. If you don't have a trace, uh, then this operator that you define on this dense subspace can be unbounded. So that's why having a trace is so useful for us. Uh, then what can you do with this? So note if you have, say, A and M, and also X and M, you can look at what is J A star J times X hat. And now the thing to notice here is that j is antilinear. So here on this formula, we have two j's, so it becomes linear. So what we've written here is a linear bounded operator. j a star j is a linear bounded operator. And what is this? Well, we just compute this. This is j a star x star hat. And now the action on the GNS construction is just by left multiplication. So this is j a star x star hat. And now this is, uh, we just add, do the add to x, a, hat. So we see that this operator j, a star j, is just right multiplication by a. Uh, in particular, what we get is that therefore, you get that j, m, j, when we look at all operators of this type, well, because j was an isometry, this will again be a von Neumann algebra. And we see that, well, right multiplication commutes with left multiplication. So this is a von Neumann algebra in the commutant of m. So this is a von Neumann uh, algebra in the commutant of m, which is with a commutant in the standard representation. All right, so whenever you have this tracial von Neumann algebra, you get the standard representation, you have this conjugation operator, and you get this new von Neumann algebra, J and J, which it lives in the commutant of M. But in, in fact, in fact, it's actually equal to the commutant. So maybe let's prove this uh, proposition that uh, we have j m j is equal to m prime and 
uh, j m prime j is equal to m. Here, here the m prime is that intersection, right? M prime. Yeah, when I write m prime here, I mean in the standard representation. So, yeah, I just didn't want to write it out here. So this is the commuton in the standard representation. Uh, okay, so we have an explicit description of the commuton in the standard representation. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove this since uh, I guess it should be good to prove some things in this lecture. Uh, yeah, so let's prove this. And if you remember last lecture on Friday, we proved something that looked very similar to this. We proved that if we had a group, then the commutant of L gamma was R gamma. And the commutant of R gamma was L gamma. And this uh, is very similar to this. In fact, you can check for a group, we have this natural isomorphism between L2 of the group von Neumann algebra and little L2 of the group. And in this case, this proposition is exactly that theorem. Um, because you have the conjugation operator. So conjugation operator there will take the Dirac function of T to the Dirac function of T inverse. And you see that that exactly changes the left and right regular representation. So this proposition is a generalization, in fact, of what we proved last time with the group von Neumann, with the group von Neumann. And so we'll follow a proof strategy that was uh, very similar to that. So let's go ahead and prove uh, this proposition. Let me write, write it out again. I'm going to need a little more room. So let's copy this over. We lost a comment on it. All right. So here's a proof of this, and it should look similar to the proof we did with the group group on any algebra. Uh, so yeah, as I remarked, we clearly have uh, two inclusions, or two inclusions are obvious. That is that J and J lives in the commutant of M, and J M prime J. Um, uh, yeah, so we have J M J clearly lives in this commutant, so we need to prove the other direction. And then once once you have this equality, of course, this one comes from just uh, taking commutants, I guess. So that's no big deal. All right, so uh, let's uh, yeah. So that we have. So this we already showed. So we just show the reverse direction. So let's suppose T is in M prime. Well, if you remember how we did for the group uh, setting, what we did is we first looked at the group times our favorite uh, vector, which was the Dirac function at the identity. And this gave us an L2. And then we also needed to find the expansion of an L2 of T applied to, um, of T star applied to the the Dirac function. And here is no different. Uh, so we know that T is in uh, M prime. So we know that T times one hat. So one hat is our cyclic vector in this case. So it's just the vector, the constant, the identity vector, which we think of inside the GNS representation. So this is a vector in L2 of M. Uh, and L2 of M, we know that we have M, which is dense inside of L2 of M. Uh, so we can write this as a limit, as N tends to infinity of some sequence uh, of the form, you know, A N hat, where A N R N N. That's just the density of M in the GNS construction. Right, so we know that whatever this vector is, it's some limit like this. Uh, but now let's compute what is T star of one hat. So to do that, we'll need to look at uh, T star of one hat, and we'll need to take the inner product with an arbitrary vector, but we know uh, M is dense, so we'll take the vector X. And right, so this is uh, for X and M. And what we can do is we'll just move T to the other side. 
and this is t times x times one hat, and there we have one hat. And now t lives in the commuton, so we can move x by and put it the other side. So this is t one hat x star hat. And now we can see that this is the limit. We can plug in the formula for t. So this is the limit as n tends to infinity of, uh, and now we plug in the formula for the inner product here. So this is the trace of x a n. Uh, okay, that looks good, but now I can use uh, the fact that this is tracial, so I use the trace property and I can rewrite this as the inner product of x hat uh, with, so this will be again the limit, so this is the limit as n tends to infinity of the inner product of x hat with a n star hat. And this was true for all x and m, which is a dense subspace of m. So what we conclude is that we conclude that therefore we get that um, t star of one hat is equal to the limit as n tends to infinity of a n star one hat. Uh, Yeah, I should also maybe argue to why this limit. Uh, so this shows that this holds on a dense subspace, uh, but I should also, uh, no, 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 it's enough to check. A, um, wait, hold on. Yeah, so why, why is this formula valid in the L2 norm? when we've only verified it on a dense subspace. And, uh, and uh, so I claim that this is at least weak star limit. Um, but uh, I guess I should remark here that the limit as n tends to infinity, so the limb, yeah, the limit uh, as n tends to infinity of x hat a and star x hat that if we take this in absolute value, um, then as from the formula above, we see that this is uh, equal to absolute value of x hat t star one hat. And so by Cauchy-Schwartz, this is less than or equal to the norm of t, and now we have the norm of x two. And so this, uh, so this formula right here uh, is why we can pass from X, a dense subspace, to now we can actually say that this holds in general. So we get that therefore this, oh, so I haven't quite proved it yet, trace this. So now we get that therefore T times T star times one hat is the limit as n tends to infinity of a n star hat. All right, it's at least the weak limit, but then we could take convex combinations if we want to actually get a limit. So we can assume that this is in the norm, right, in the Hilbert space norm. Uh, okay, so that was the computation that if we have some representation of t one hat, then we also have a similar representation of t star one hat. And similarly, if we have S, which is in um, uh, JMJ prime, so an S applied to one hat is equal to some limit as N tends to infinity of J B N J one hat. So then we can write S star one hat is the limit as N tends to infinity of J B N star J. So we can similarly, if we have something that commutes with J M J, we can 
and we have this approximation when we apply the vector one hat, we have this approximation for the adjoint. All right, so now let's put these things together. We get the therefore, if we look at uh, um, T times S, one hat, one hat, and I want to compute what is this, right, for T commuting with M and S commuting with J and J. Well, what does that give us? That gives us this is the limit as N and M tend to infinity of, uh, let's see if we do S first. Uh, well, we'll move T to the other side so that we get T adjoint. So we have here S, so that's J, B, N, J, one hat. And here we have T star, which we know is A, N star one half. I guess one should be an N, one should be an M. But now J, B, N, J one hat is just B, N star. So we see that this is the limit as N tends to infinity, limit M tends to infinity of the trace of A, M, B, N star. Okay, and again, we can use the tracial property to rewrite this as the limit as n tends to infinity, limit as m tends to infinity, and now we have inner product here, uh, am uh, hat, and now we have j, b, n, j, which put a star there, times one hat. And now we see that here we've written T, here we've written S star. So we can rewrite this is exactly the inner product of S T one half. All right, so that means at least if we apply them to the tracial vector, so if we apply uh, them to the tracial vector, we get that T S is equal to S T. But now in general, so if we have say X and Y and M, so then we can look at what is T S X hat Y hat. And we'll do the same trick we did before with the group algebras. So we can bring the Y to the other side and rewrite this as Y star T S. And here I'm going to put a J X star J one hat one hat. And now use the fact that T commutes with uh, T commutes with M, so these commute. S commutes with J, M, J, so these commutes. So I can rewrite this as, and then of course, Y and J, X star J together commute. So this is T, J, X star J times Y star S. And now what do we have? Well, T J star J commutes with M. So this lives in the commutant of M because T does and so does J X star J. Whereas this thing right here lives in the commutant of J M J because S lives there and so does uh, Y. By now we can do this computation which we already showed up here if we have some vector in M prime and some vector in J M J prime then applying them to the vector one, it doesn't matter the order. So we get that this is the same as y star s, t, j, x star j, one hat, one hat, which is then exactly just s, t, one hat, one hat, or sorry, uh, x, x hat, and then y hat. So what do we see? We see that therefore t, s is equal to s, t. All right, so that's the N computation. So what does that mean? But T was an arbitrary vector in M prime and S was an arbitrary vector in J, M, J prime. So we get therefore um, uh, M prime commutes with everything of that form. So this lives in J, M, J uh, prime prime. It's the commutant of all these things. But now by the bicommutant theorem, this is J and J. All right, so that, uh, and that's exactly the inclusion we, we wanted to prove. 
So this should look familiar. Like I said, it is actually a, indeed a generalization of the case for group one Riemann algebras that we proved last time um, when you translate the language properly. But this holds in general. So for any time you have a tracial von Neumann algebra, you have the standard representation, which has this really nice property that the commutant is very explicit. It's just J and J. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I want to stop here. Let me just end by mentioning three things because it would be out of place to do it. So three classical facts. that I'll mention here, but I won't prove. The first is that if M is an abelian von Neumann algebra, uh, so then actually this example I gave you, so if you have a measure space, you get an abelian von Neumann algebra, but the converse is also true. So this is a theorem of von Neumann. Uh, so then, M is actually isomorphic to L infinity of X mu for some measure space. And we might take in this still be a standard measure space if M has separable pre dual. Uh, the other thing is that if M is separable, so separable, when we say a von Neumann algebra separable, we mean separable pre-dual. Or it acts on a separable Hilbert space. If M is separable, uh, so then there's always this sort of direct integral decomposition. So this was introduced by von Neumann, but I won't define exactly what this is, but uh, you can always write M as some sort of direct, it's a generalization of direct sums, it's a direct integral, and this is where each MX has trivial center, so is a factor. Factors are when they have trivial center. So this is, uh, this is Murray and von Neumann, they have a series of four papers, and one of them is solo authored by von Neumann, and that's uh, where he proves this, the third paper. Uh, and then the final fact, which I'll remark here but not prove, and that is that if the center of M is separable, so again, meaning has separable free dual, uh, so then uh, M has a normal faithful uh, trace if and only if it satisfies the following uh, implication, that is whenever you have an operator V star V equals one, that implies that V V star is also equal to one. So these are called finite von Neumann algebras. That's what Maria von Neumann called finite von Neumann algebra because they viewed uh, elements of the von Neumann algebra as morphisms. And so what this says is that if you have an injective morphism, then it's automatically surjective. Uh, so that's what that statement is saying, which is exactly a property of finite sets. So they call this property finite von Neumann algebras. And if you have separable center, so in particular, if M is separable itself, you're finite if and only if there exists, um, there exists a normal faithful traceable state. Uh, okay. All right. I'll go ahead and stop here. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. I have one quick. Go, Goichi. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, equivalent condition of, of normal functional. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that uh, uh, sigma weak continuous uh, linear functional is equivalent to the a WOT continuity on closed unit pool. Yes. But I, I didn't know that it's uh, equivalent to WOT continuity. No, 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 you're right. It's not, it's not. Uh, okay, so yeah, I should be a little bit careful uh, because of course not every, 
sigma weak operator topology continuous linear functional is weak operator topology continuous, uh, or other way around. Um, uh, yes, but still being closed for convex sets, being closed in one is the same as being closed in the other topology. So that uh, von, yeah, von Neumann algebras will be closed in any of these topologies. Yes, yes, I agree with that. Okay, but thank you for pointing that out, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is about the standard construction for the case of the L infinity of X. Will, in mm -hmm. that case, will the, the L2 of L infinity yeah. would be just L2 of, of, of X? Yeah, you can check that uh, L2 of L infinity of X mu with respect to its integral is naturally isomorphic to L2 of X mu uh, with the action on both being the same. So there's a isomorph, the natural isomorphism preserves mm -hmm. local multiplication. You can also check that L2 of L gamma with respect to its canonical trace. Um, coming from the Dirac function is naturally isomorphic to L2 of gamma. And again, and again, that's the same way that uh, takes left multiplication to the usual action. And also the right multiplication is the right regular representation. Yeah. And you can also check that L2 of L infinity of X mu crossed gamma with respect to the canonical trace I introduced there uh, that this is naturally isomorphic to L2 of X mu tensor L2 of gamma. And again, in a way that all of these uh, correspond. Okay, makes sense. I guess that's why they're called standard too, right? <laughs> yes. In fact, for a, a tracial von Neumann algebra, uh, or for a, a finite factor, uh, this your representation will be standard if and only if it has a, um, a cyclic and the commutant has a cyclic vector. This is the. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? All right. Great. 